Welcome everyone. I believe we are live. Just let me double check some settings. Perfect, perfect. All right, so welcome to the Westport Museum for History and Cultures live stream. Uh, we are doing our Tuesday treasure program. We usually do these once a month, but with the world as it is, we are going to be doing these uh, once a week. Um, do let me know if my volume is loud enough, any issues. Now, we are going to be doing these once a week on Tuesdays. This week, we are focusing on our collection of tin toys. Now, this is just a selection of our collection, uh, but we do have many more. This is just some of the um, most interesting examples. Now, tonight, I, Nicole Carpenter, will be showing you these toys. I am putting on gloves, which you can see right now. This is to protect our collections. Um, not a part of the world as it is today. Uh, I am going to go through the history of these objects. Uh, I'm going to show you some demonstrations of what some of them do. And then at the end, please feel free to type your questions in. Feel free to type your questions in during uh, my discussion, and I will go through as many of them as I can at the end. Now, all of these tin toys are lithograph tin toys, or lithograph printed tin. Most of these toys are produced in the United States. A few of them are from other countries of the world, namely Germany, Japan, and we have one from Ireland as well. We'll get to that a little bit later. Now, none of these toys are produced in Westport, but what they do show us for Westport's history is how the toy industry um, really is a global industry and how it influenced play of the time, which we'll go into a little bit more. Most of these toys are from the mid 20th century, so somewhere around 1940, some a little bit earlier, a little, some a little bit later. Now, tin toys in general were first introduced in the mid 19th century, so the 1850s. Now, those tin toys were mostly decorated by hand. It was a very laborious um, activity. Technology progressed by probably about 1890 or 1900. We were able to use, or producers were able to use lithography. They were able to actually apply the detailing, the color, and onto a rubber roller, which was then applied to the raw tin that had already been shaped, or would be shaped afterwards, excuse me. Now, this was much, much less expensive than cast iron or wood of the time. Again, both very laborious um, processes. Now, by 1900, with this mechanization, Germany actually became the lead producer of mechanized tin lithograph toys. Both France and Europe were also in this industry, but never truly matched the level of production that Germany had. And the United States was also in this, um, this industry, but was not a major player until World War I. Now, World War I, of course, is in the European theater to begin with. So Germany, France, and England all had to divert these resources towards war production, whereas the U.S. could still, again, as they were not into the war until later on, were able to produce these toys at a much higher rate. Now, all of these companies, no matter where they were um, placed, drew on celebrities of the time, uh, animated film, like Walt Disney was a huge, huge influence on the tin toy production industry. Uh, to really bring inspiration to their toys. Now, of course, World War II is the big uh, influencer on tin toys and their production where they're based out of. Now, the U.S. is much more involved in World War II, so they divert a lot of resources away. And after World War II, the lead producer of tin toys actually becomes Japan, who has licenses um, with many American companies to produce these toys. And that goes through uh, the 1980s um, when plastic mainly takes over for toys. So that's just general history. Now we're going to go into some of the particular items. So the first toy that I would like to show you, I'll take some of these away, they will be coming back. The first that I'd like to show you is actually from a biscuit company. 
And this is a biscuit company based out of Ireland, one of the few items that we have tonight that is from um, a European producer. Now, this toy <laughs> looks very unassuming. This is a biscuit container for Jacob's Biscuits. Let me bring you a little closer. Go further down so you can see a little bit better. Now, Jacob's Biscuit was founded by William and Robert Jacob, two brothers in 1851, produced out of Dublin. And they would go on to produce biscuits for over 150 years. There is still a version of their company active today. Now, what's particularly uh, interesting about this example is it's one of the oldest examples in our collection. It's from the 1920s. But this is actually, if I open it very, very gently, you can see, hopefully, the name of Jacob's Biscuits here. But what is so exciting about this object is that it has some slots down here on the bottom that you can see. And when you slide this object back and forth, I hope you can hear that, it acts as an accordion and it actually makes um, a kind of very, very simple musical note. And it was a very creative way that Jacobs could uh, market their biscuits. The next tin toy that I'm going to show you, I'm actually going to show you a group of them. Now you may have seen when we first started that we had three toys that all had some version of a rooster or a chicken on them. Now, I believe it is this first. This chicken here is an American company. It's actually invented by Stanley Krakowski, excuse me, uh, and it's produced in the 1950s. Now this is also a toy that makes a noise, but not a musical noise. It is a crowing toy rooster. Now this toy, um, unfortunately, is not in working condition, but there are slots, or sorry, holes here on the top. And when this toy was rocked back and forth, or up, upside down and back the correct way, it would make a crowing noise. And this does have, I believe down here, a patent, oh, I'm sorry, a patent number so that we can always uh, research these items and find more background about them. That's definitely a way to look at tin toys if you're ever looking to acquire some of your own. Now, this piece is also an American produced tin toy. This is a company out of Newark, New Jersey called W.J. Stanley Novelty Company and it is from the 1940s. Now this toy is also not in working condition, but this would be wound, this handle, and out of the top would come a clucking noise. And it is decorated on the outside with these lovely kind of circus scenes. The third kind of chicken toy that we have is this here. Now this chicken was manufactured by the Baldwin Manufacturing Company, and this is out of Brooklyn, New York. Now, Baldwin Manufacturing is mainly known for its production of military-related toys, uh, many cannons and ships, but this is one of the few toys that they produced of an animal. Uh, this chicken was actually called a laying hen, and the way that this would work was these small, small tin eggs would be placed in this hole at the top. And by winding the handle here on the side, the chicken would then lay these eggs over on this side. And again, the production or the manufacturing label is here on the side. You can see. Now, the next 
tin toy that I'm going to show you is actually uh, the rarest in our collection, um, but it's also one of my favorites. Now this is called, very simple title, but it is Monkey Tipping Cap Paint, uh, Bank. Now this tin toy was produced by Jay Sheen and Co. in the 1930s. Now Sheen was, uh, Sheen and Co., excuse me, was uh, mainly in business in the early 1900s. So that's really when it is known for its most um, interesting tin toys. It was founded by Julia Sheen in New York City, apparently in his loft. Uh, it is, its earliest known toy was for a line um, of Cracker Jacks. But by 1907, Sheen was producing its own toys. It was producing piggy banks, uh, noisemakers like the other ones that we've seen, and also model horse-drawn carriages, which is a very, very popular type of tin toy. They also uh, manufactured toys under Walt Disney and King Feature Syndicate. Uh, they produced toys such as Popeye and Felix the Cat. Now by 1926, Julia Sheen was actually uh, killed in a horse riding accident in Central Park. Control of his company passed to his brother-in-law, Samuel Hockman, who was the owner and CEO of a rival toy company, um, Mohawk Toy Company. And under Hoffman, Sheehan and company expanded and was able to produce toys such as the Monkey Tipping Cap Bank. Um, they were very, very successful in producing circus themed toys, uh, also amusement park themed toys like roller coasters and Ferris wheels. Now this toy is considered fairly rare because it is from the golden age of tin toys, especially from the Sheen, country, uh, Sheen Company. And you can actually see its label here on the back. And the bank would operate by placing a coin into the slot here. And when it did, it actually activated a mechanism that would make the monkey tip its cap at you. Really beautiful. One of my most favorite tin toys out of our collection is the Proud Peacock, which is from the Alps Soji Limited Company. Now by winding the side mechanism here, the peacock would actually ra uh, raise and lower as well as walk um, once it was wound up. Now this is a Japanese uh, based company and they produced tin toys through the 1940s. Again, after World War I, they actually began in 1948 and they produced toys until the 1970s. And this is one of their, uh, one of their most well-known and their logo is actually very well known as well because of the mountain motif. Now the last tin toy that I have to show you this evening is, makes a little bit of noise, my apologies, is a wind-up elephant. Now this tin toy was produced by an American, or sorry, by a German company, but it is actually produced in 1950 in the American zone of Germany. Now we know this because if we look very, very closely on the foot of our elephant, we can see that it says made in the US zone. And then on the opposite side, it says Germany. Now after World War I, many of these uh, German based tin toy companies were able to operate with US uh, permission and through US companies as well. And this is one of those. This is actually a toy that is probably based out of Bavaria in Germany. Now this toy is in operating order, so I'm going to show you a brief little demonstration of how it works. Let me back it up a little bit more. So those are our 
our tin toys, our tin toy collection. Um, if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them. Let me put some of our toys back here so you can remember any of your questions if you have any. Now again, these tin toys are not from Westport itself, but they really help us understand the way uh, that play has evolved. They help us understand what kind of goods were being brought into um, Westport and what was popular. And um, it helps us understand the, the, the industry, the global industry that was um, responsible for these tin toys. And some of these, uh, like the Sheen Monkey Bank, um, was produced very, very close by. Um, and of course, we know that Westport has many, many connections to New York and these very um, artistic communities in New York, especially during the turn of the century um, and during both of the World Wars through the 1950s. I do have a question for the audience. If any of you could choose between more traditional toys like these and toys of today, which would be more popular today, do you think? Or would be more popular with you? Which would you rather um, rather see? I really enjoy the uh, design of many of these toys. They're very, uh, very, very reminiscent of very reminiscent of comics, which is just wonderful. So we do have a question from Samantha and she asks, did they come to you as a group? They did, wonderful question. We were very, very fortunate to receive a donation of tin toys and music boxes um, from a Mr. Klausman, and he has a really, really large, really, really wonderful collection of toys that he donated to the museum at one time. Um, I believe that there were over 50 pieces. So it was a really large collection that we, um, we were able to, to acquire, and we really love um, looking into them and being able to show them off to all of you. I really enjoy the Jacobs tin toy um, because it is uh, a, a marketing piece as well. It has multiple uses, so it would have been packed with their biscuits first. Um, and then as you finish them off, you could uh, pass it on to your children and they could use it as um, a toy as well. So it was very, very multifunctional, which is fabulous. Many of these others are purely produced. I think all of them are purely produced. Oh, I suppose, except for the Sheen Monkey, um, as toys. Um, so the more multifunctional that we can, we can see these toys being, I think the more interesting they become. So we have another question from Nick, and he asks, what kind of care goes into keeping these toys in such good condition? Now that is a really important question uh, for museums um, everywhere, especially right now. Uh, to care for these toys, we keep them in a very, very specific um, climate. We keep them at a, at a specific temperature and humidity. And then we also keep them in a very light sensitive area. So we, um, in the storage of our collections, we try to um, really care for them the way that they need to be cared for. Um, another good example is wearing gloves like these, keeping um, our oils and things off of them so that they don't um, rust. Um, keeping them light controlled also keeps them from fading. That was a fantastic question. Thank you. It's also wonderful to find these toys in working condition. Uh, as a museum, we do not play with our toys, which is unfortunate, very sad sometimes. Um, but it also keeps them in really, really good condition. We love to see that they're working, but by uh, 
playing with them or using them, it can actually degrade the mechanism and lead to them not being in working condition anymore. So you've got a little bit of a, a special treat this evening by seeing um, some of our toys in action. As I said, they did come in as a large group. So if you're interested in seeing maybe some of the music boxes that came in during this um, donation, I would love to do another session, maybe showing our music boxes. They are also many of them from very similar companies. Uh, many of them are also lithograph printed, um, very, very comic book style, um, very, very lovely. And many of them are still in working condition as well. So we have another question and it's, do you know when tin toys went out of favor? Now that is also a very good question. Tin toys, again, were in their kind of heyday in the 1920s, 1930s, and again saw a boom just after World War II um, with the late 40s and 50s. It's really with the uh, introduction of plastics, specifically Bakelite, that really replaces tin toys. Um, there are more regulations put in place, at least in the United States, um, around the 50s and 60s into the 70s and 80s. Uh, these regulations were on the edges of tin toys, which can be very sharp if not uh, cared for correctly. And these regulations put a lot of companies um, not out of business, but it made them really rethink their strategies in making these toys. It was also much cheaper to use these very um, new inventions of plastic and Bakelite plastic. Um, so probably around the, the 50, late 50s and the early 60s is when tin toys really, really started to drop off. One thing that is nice is tin toys are still in production today. Um, there are some small companies that still continue to produce these toys. Um, I don't know any off the top of my head, but I know there are some of these small production companies that still carry on this tradition of lithograph mechani uh, mechanized tin toys, which are really, really uh, lovely and fantastic to see. So we don't have any other questions. If you do have any other questions, do feel free to comment on this video. We will get back to you as soon as we can. I will try to reach out to you uh, through our comment box. I want to thank you so much for joining me and the Westport Museum this evening. I hope you enjoyed. And I do hope that you will come back next Tuesday when I will be discussing the sports teams in Westport, mainly the Owls football team. And I may perhaps have a Paul Newman artifact um, to show you all. So have a wonderful evening. Please stay safe and please join us in the future.